Good evening, and welcome to Critics' Choice. Your host for tonight, the Mid-South's leading film critic, Sterling Smith. Good evening, Sterling Smith for Critics' Choice. Tonight, the second half of a two-part interview, and tonight, joining Christopher Lee, my guest from last week, is Mr. Robin Hardy. Christopher Lee and Robin Hardy are appearing here in the South, uh, really appearing out of faith for a film that they together made with Anthony Schaffer in Scotland, an incredible film, the winner of the grand prize at the Paris International uh, Fantasy and uh, Science Fiction Festival, uh, a magnificent film praised around the world by critics, The Wicker Man. Robin Hardy is the director, Anthony Schaffer, with his brother well, really, Anthony Schaffer wrote the screenplay. His brother, Peter Schaffer, did much research on the film, and they all worked uh, hand in glove. Paul Giovanni was the composer, and Christopher Lee, Britt Eklund, and Edward Woodward were the stars of the film. Uh, my guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, Robin. Christopher. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, you, uh, last week, uh, one thing we didn't get the touch upon, Christopher, and we were covering so many things from the uh, the the range of languages you speak, to the fact that you uh, sing opera, to the fact that you published an autobiography, was the fact that you worked with uh, Orson Welles in oh, a yeah. production. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Marvelous uh, experience. Uh, Moby Dick, I gather. One of the true, yes. of the one, and the very few, complete geniuses in the history of the cinema. Nobody would ever deny that. Uh, I think that my fondest and most vivid memory of Orson was the fact that the first time I played a scene with Patrick McGowan from Orson Welles' production of Moby Dick for television, he talked all the way through our scene from behind the camera, and we wondered at the time just what was going to come out at the other end. Uh, however, I suppose the greatest remark that he ever made was when he suddenly, for no reason at all, said action, for no reason whatsoever. I mean, we hadn't even rehearsed. Action. And the operator of the camera was startled, to say the least, turned to him and said, but Mr. Wells, I haven't got a setup yet. And Orson looked at him and said, <laughs> find one and surprise me. <laughs> Which I think is uh, one of the greatest remarks I've ever heard in 30 years in show business. Well, going, working with men such as Orson Wells and the wide range of experience you have in film, uh, uh, what is it about the wicker man that, 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 that has, and I know what it is because I, I love the film, I adore it, but could you tell my friends in the audience what for you personally is it that makes it feel, uh, 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 makes you feel it, it is the magnificent film it is and your role in it is, is what it is for you? Yes, of course uh, I could answer that question at an enormous length, which yes. I obviously <laughs> I cannot do. Right. Uh, Robin is far more qualified, I think, to talk about the film as a whole. Exactly, than I but am. I would like to move I can only from say, the... simply yes. from speaking as an actor, speaking um, as the actor was fortunate enough to play the part, fortunate enough to play Lord Summerisle, I can only say that it's by far the best part I've ever had, and the best written part, and the most absorbing, fascinating, and challenging film. That I've ever worked in. Over and above the Orson Welles production or Indeed, Three Musketeers? Over and above, uh, or including any. every film I've ever made. This to me was one of the, was not only one of the greatest challenges to me as an actor, but was certainly the most fascinating film I've ever been involved in. It's the best script I've ever, ever had at my disposal, you might say. Uh, the great value of this picture is that, as I've said many times before, there is something for everyone in it. It operates on so many different levels and is totally acceptable in all areas, at all levels. But I think its main uh, advantage is the fact that I don't think anyone has ever seen a film like it. And this seems to be the reaction of the people who have seen it, particularly the critics. There has never been a film like this. It is a unique picture. Well, I think I've said enough now as the actor and I would rather Exactly. Infinitely prefer that Robin should discuss the film as a film. But I told I, you what I feel about it as an actor. Of course. Uh, the reason I chose to introduce uh, tonight's show with uh, a reference to Orson Welles is because even though Christopher has worked with talented directors from Richard Lester to Orson Welles, it is his association with Robin Hardy in The Wicker Man that has brought him into the South 
and that has filled him with the, the enthusiasm that so many critics around the world, including myself, share regarding this experience. And I think that's uh, rather an interesting way to uh, introduce our New Orleans audience to Mr. Robin Harty, who is the creator of The Wicker Man. Robin, it was your dream project, I gather, with Tony Schaffer. Is that right? Yes, it was, yes. Yes, and how many years did you work on the film? I understand the research behind it is, is incredible. It's all authentic, and uh, could you get into it a bit? We, we worked on it for about 18 months before we had a final screenplay, but the whole story was invented in one um, rather wild weekend um, <laughs> on an island in the Thames. Um, when we thought, wouldn't it be fun to do a film which would have Christopher in it, because uh, um, uh, Tanny had always wanted to do a film with Christopher, using his, his various talents and somewhat different ways to which they'd been used before. Including his magnificent singing voice. Well, indeed. Um, but th that wasn't quite, quite what we had in mind when we started. Oh, no. Uh, w um, and I sprang it on them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the end of this weekend, we knew what the story was. And uh, we wanted a story which uh, fitted perhaps into the horror genre, but which was more a film fantastique. Uh, Absolutely. Which is a, a, a French a genre that we, we, we have in, this, in the United States and in, and, in, and in England, but which we don't really have a label for. Um, and I don't think this film can be labeled. Um, no, I don't think it can. But I think it is. I think it is a film fantastic right. in a way, um, rather like um, uh, Marcel Carney's films and so on and so forth. It, it has that sort of quality, and uh, Eerie, a, a film fantastic can can ha can have almost anything in it. It's it's based on fact, but it can take flights flights of fantasy which are still rooted to the to the truth, to the you know, and uh, to the reality of the story so that the imagination can roam. And that's the kind of story we wanted it to be. We also wanted to do something which connected with the horror genre, but which didn't use those old, well, um, now fairly well-worn themes of um, um, witches and pentacles and spells and things, but which went back to what uh, that kind of so-called black art, black magic, had originally come from, which was the religion which, in Western Europe, Christianity replaced the old religion. Which and is the Celtic? The, well, it was paganism, it, for lack of a better yes, word, indeed. in its various forms. That's right. I mean, uh, basically, the Celtic um, gods and the and the, the Bulgarian German gods and the and the and the Roman and the Greek ones were really all the same family with slightly different names. Right. Um, and uh, and the, the customs that that, came, that come down to us, which are really our roots. I mean, you know, this is this is our. Western European roots. And it was these traditions that led you to make the decision to film entirely on location in Scotland. Yes, respect indeed. Respect for these yes. traditions. I think that's because the Celts, um, uh, the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh have kept these things alive more than perhaps any other group of Western Europeans, and it seemed a very appropriate place to place it. Also, we needed an island, which was a microcosm in which the, this whole um, you know, exciting story could take place. Right. Well, Christopher has described the film to me. Um, off camera during dinner one time is, is, uh, is really Robin Hardy, uh, Tony Schaffer's uh, 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 sort of box within a box within a box. And uh, uh, it concerns a policeman, uh, of course, who comes to the uh, island uh, under which, uh, well, under the reign of Lord Sumra. Uh, benevolent. Like. Yes, benevolent, 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 reign, benevolent yes. indeed. Yeah. And uh, this first scene we're going to watch tonight is going to give you a little of a flavor of what the Wicker Man is all about. And I might add, this is no ordinary film. <laughs> I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid self-contained. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one of them kneels to another or to his own kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one of them is respectable or unhappy all over the earth. Gently, Johnny, my jingle 
Now, as is clearly evidenced by the scene you've just watched, uh, tonight's film, uh, we're under discussion, the, the Wicker Man, is in fact a brilliant and incredible film. And I, as you know, I do not use those words, do not use those words lightly. Um, it's interesting that Robin Hardy, in his first directorial venture, should have the success that few other uh, directors uh, have had in their first venture. Perhaps Steven Spielberg, with his television film that later on went on to great success on the continent, Duel, had exactly that, that, that same experience. Uh, Robin, uh, how, do, how does it, uh, uh, in making a film that critics around the world have called, actually called a masterpiece, uh, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the arduous task of the filming. Uh, I understand that it was simply incredible. It was filmed in, in winter when it was supposed to be spring and, uh, and, and all kinds of other things that for a director in, in his first feature film are just tremendous things to take on. Well, they certainly were, but I was very fortunate in that um, in this film I was working with somebody who had been my partner working in television right. um, for some eight or nine years before, Anthony Schaffer. And we had alternated in chores like producing and writing and directing during those years. And so we were already a team who were very used to working together. Um, and um, when we finally got the go-ahead from the money people that we had the money for this film, uh, we had had months of, of careful preparation, and that gave me tremendous confidence. We also had a cast, which was really extraordinary. We had um, Christopher, who uh, I had been longing to work with, who had had a great deal of discussion with us in the formative stages of the script about the character we were creating for him. Um, we had decided that we were going to introduce the musical element because uh, paganism was full of songs and dancing and eroticism and so on and so forth. And we wanted to put that into the film so that Absolutely. people would feel what a pagan society was like. Um, and uh, when we finally faced the logistic problems, uh, they were simply logistic problems. They weren't complicated by the fact that we, the writer, the director, and the actors didn't know exactly what we wanted to do. We did from the very beginning. The schedule went just like clockwork. And strangely Well, that's a credit to you, because I understand some of the difficulties were. Well, they were very great. Yeah, really. They were very great. But they, but they were... Uh, Climac climactic, is that the word? <laughs> the climate? Yes. yes. We, we, we were shooting in, in, uh, in late October, November, and December in the west of Scotland. In, in order to not mm. see the breath of the actors in, <laughs> in, in uh, the streets, we had them actually uh, work with hot fans under their faces, uh, blow fans, and, and ice in their mouths mm. when they weren't actually on, on uh, when they were in the long shots. Because uh, only that way could we stop in the freezing weather, not, not knowing that we weren't in a, a bright spring May day. And the rest of your cast, of course, included uh, Britt Eklund, Edward Woodward. Britt Eklund. Poor Britt Eklund, who had to do a dance. Um, in the buff. Not, uh, in the buff, yes. yes. Uh, all together, as uh, you say, yes. In, in, yes. in, in uh, a real cold Scottish inn. Uh, for three days, she went on dancing in the buff. And, and I must say, she did very creditably and... Uh, and uh, He's also very credibly suing Rod Stewart now for 25 million, I might add. That I don't think has any connection with what no, you I were doing <laughs> in Scotland. No, I don't know. Um, I do understand that, sort of thing. that he that he had some interest in in uh, there was some announcement that he was had some interest in buying buying the, the movie so as to prevent this scene from oh, really? shown. Yes. Oh yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Although quite why he should, I don't know. I think it's a very beautiful scene. It's a very erotic scene, and it's certainly in no way. Uh, it's a very erotic uh, film. In fact, the choreography for the scene is totally authentic, and uh, you brought in, uh, I gather. Um, an expert for that, didn't you? Yes, we brought in a choreographer um, to help us choreograph her, um, her dance. And um, what I would like to say about this is that I think one of the, the original things that come out of the script, which are exciting in the movie, is that there are two important um, seduction scenes in the film in which you never see uh, the actual, uh, the, the two people never meet, or you don't, you don't see them meet. Um, uh, they're played entirely. Uh, off the reactions of everybody else around in the inn. And I think that that, that heightens the erotic effect of the movie, at least that's what we okay. hoped, and it does it seem to have that effect on the audience. There are also openly erotic scenes in the film. Oh, no question. <laughs>
In today's film industry, there are, in my opinion, too many films made for all the wrong reasons. Every now and again, there's a film made by a group of people who get together and make it because they have a passion for it, they believe in it. Anthony Schaffer, the author of Sleuth, the author of Alfred Hitchcock's Frenzy, now writing Murder on the Nile, the Agatha Christie novel being adopted for the screen. Peter Schaffer, the author of Equus, Royal Hunt of the Sun. Their dear friend Robin Hardy, the director, the star Christopher Lee, and all of the other talented people involved in the film, in this strange, bizarre film that defies, utterly defies classification, made The Wicker Man virtually as an act of faith. And in a sense, the film, in a very real sense, the film deals with faith. I understand that uh, you took a very small salary to make this film, uh, Robin, because you believe so much in its content. And in fact, Christopher and the, and the producer, etc., uh, worked for, well, you tell us. Nothing whatsoever. Nothing whatsoever. Nothing whatsoever. Quite an Tony exception Schaffer in this business. Tony uh, wrote the screenplay for nothing. Peter Snell produced the picture for nothing. I played the part for nothing. And Robin directed Rook it for virtually nothing. Virtually nothing. nothing. And uh, I think that does show the measure of our total devotion and total involvement uh, as far as this film is concerned. Well, now, this film, w why do you think this film, Robin, uh, was capable and is now capable in the way that it's capturing audiences throughout the country of, of generating this kind of involvement? What is it about this film that makes it uh, so much more than what, well, so much makes it what it is? Well, I think this film is um, awakes in people, a kind of tribal memory. It's full of echoes from our past, from our childhood, from the very things that are around us in every day. We, have, we go to church on Sunday, and we forget that Sunday was originally a day when we worshiped the sun, didn't go to church. The film is about conflicting faiths, as we, we said. Right. We knock on wood um, because we want to ward off evil. The film is full of the symbols of that wood. Of the earth, the fire, uh, the earth, water. the fire, and the elements. Uh, elements. Um, it's full of the symbols that we have in Christian feasts today, like um, um, the Easter money, which is originally the March hare, um, the tree at Christmas, the mistletoe, all those things are a part of our tribal past. And uh, this film keeps on bringing them in. It brings them in in children's songs, which are deadly serious songs in this movie. But we remember as uh, Oranges and Lemons and, and uh, Ring a Ring of Roses and things like that, but which had deadly earnest meanings originally. The last song in the movie, Summer is a Coming oh, yes. In, is probably the oldest song in the world. And I think this fascinates people. And if I may use this uh, comparison again, very much the way Roots fascinated people, because uh, people are fascinated by their collective past, um, and particularly when they can find it all around them in the present. But it taps it in a curious kind of way that both uh, fascinates, and I think that's the third time I've used the word fascinate tonight, and at the same time, ultimately terrifies, because it has yes. a way of making people uncomfortable in a good, a healthy kind of there's, way. There's a very it, it provokes a thought process, an examination of oneself and where one's at. There's a very good uh, reason for that, I think, uh, Sterling, and that is because those things which uh, are part of our superstitions, which are, which are part of so many of our everyday, um, or accepted as everyday um, uh, customs that we do at various times of the year and so on and so forth, uh, are, are things that for a long time were banned or were, um, we were superstitious about. Because for, for centuries the church, um, for all sorts of reasons, because they were connected in something oh, yes. in our tribal memory, um, try to make us forget where they came from. So that in itself has a, a mounting reminder to the audience, where they, which is almost subconscious, of, oh, it is. of fear and guilt uh, about what is going on. Um, add to that the fact that we made a film about a propitiating society, a society which um, puts out milk for the little people to stop them doing nasty things, which is what all superstition is about, um, is uh, quite different from a film about simply good and evil. The people and the pagans in our film aren't just plain evil. Uh, they oh, are no. trying to make sure that the, that, uh, the gods uh, give them a chance to have a, 
a good tomorrow if they propitiate those gods, if they, if they sacrifice and those therein, gods. And therein enters the question of the wicker man, and I'm not going to say anything more about that, except the wicker man, well, when uh, the characters in our film deal with him, they deal with him in a very terrifying and meaningful sort of way. But uh, Robin mentioned uh, the Easter Bunny, the March Hare. Let's watch a scene in which uh, the March Hare appears as it appears in this film. The patching and plugging is his delight. I found that in Rowan Morrison's grave. Little Rowan loved the march hairs. Mm. A sacrilege. Only if the ground is consecrated to the Christian belief. Personally, I think it makes a very lovely transmutation. I'm sure Rowan is most happy with it. Do you not think so, Lord Samurai? Miss, I hope you don't think that I can be made a fool of indefinitely. Where is Rowan Morrison? Well, here she is. What remains of her physically? Her soul, of course, may even not... Lord Summerisle! Where is Rowan Morrison? Sergeant Howie, I think that you are supposed to be the detective here. A child is reported missing on your island. At first I'm told there is no such child. I, I, I then find that there is, in fact, but she has been killed. I subsequently discovered that there is no death certificate. And now I find that there is a grave. There's no body. Very perplexing for you. What do you think can have happened? I think Rowan Morrison was murdered under circumstances of pagan barbarity, which I can scarcely bring myself to believe as taking place in the 20th century. The Wicker Man, a box within a box, a mystery film, a film of paganism, a film of faith, a film brilliantly directed by one of our guests tonight, Robin Harty, written by Anthony Schaffer, and a film of song. But songs that mean more when you think about them than perhaps uh, the songs that we hear today on the radio uh, within what they convey. Songs that are songs within songs within songs, if you like. And in closing out tonight, other than thanking both of my charming guests for being here, I think, thank you, Robin. And Christopher, I think it might be appropriate if Mr. Lee uh, were to uh, give us a tune from the fascinating film, the brilliant award-winning film, now playing in your local theaters, The Wicker Man. Christopher, please. Oh, uh, the Tinker of Rye, perhaps. <laughs> yes, The Tinker of Rye would be delightful. There was a tinker lived of late who walked the streets of Rye. He bore his pack upon his back Patches and plugs did cry. Oh, I have brass within my bag, my hammer's full of metal. And as to skill, I well can clout and mend a broken kettle. For patching and plugging is my delight. My work goes forward day and night. <laughs> <laughs>